good afternoon. This is Terry Allen, and I want to do a little quick video. And the title of this video is Why I Like the Jimmy Dore Show and Why I Like Convo Couch. And here's the reason. But let me give some background first. Back in the 80s, when I got out of college, I joined an organization called the Fusion Energy Foundation. And the reason I did that was because I was very interested in the fusion technology as a future energy source. The, um, the technology would revolutionize everything if we can develop it. Well, the Fusion Energy Foundation, they printed a magazine and they talked about all the technologies and the scientists that were working on different projects. And it was pretty fascinating. The group that started this foundation was associated with Lenin LaRouche. And I don't know how many people remember him now, but back in the 1980s, he ran for president a couple of times. He taught economics at Columbia University. And the guy was brilliant. He had always said, if you want to learn history, don't read a textbook because you won't learn it that way. What you need to do is actually read from the people that actually lived it and wrote books about it. And that's the only way you're going to learn about history, particularly American history. So that's what I did. I studied everything. I read everything I could find. I got hundreds of books that I've collected over the years. And most of them <laughs> are are by presidents and they're all nonfiction. I got a few fiction books, but mostly it was just stories about different presidents and different things, um, different events. And American history is absolutely fascinating. And the key thing about it is the battle between the colonies and the British, the British East India Company specifically. The the fight was specifically about economics. Now, you had one part of it, which was taxation without representation. You had freedom of speech and freedom of religion. But the biggest problem, and the thing that pissed off George Washington the most, was that he used to grow tobacco in Virginia. And he would say that it costs a certain amount of money to grow tobacco to produce a bushel. And so what would happen was the, the way the British East India Company had set this thing up was that you couldn't sell the tobacco to your neighbors. You couldn't sell to any of the colonies. You had to sell it to them and then they would process it and then they would sell it to the colonies. So you can see the problem with that immediately. Well, what would happen is the ship would come in and say, okay, um, we will offer you, let's say, a dollar a bushel for the tobacco. And George Washington would say, well, it cost me two dollars a bushel to grow it and to produce it, my cost. And they would say, take it or leave it. And that is the problem with free trade capitalism. Because you can see the problem, and that was one of the main reasons that George Washington and some of the other um, founding fathers um, got together and decided to break away. The interesting thing was there was only one-third of the American population that wanted to break away from the British. There was one-third that was pro-British, and then there was one-third that didn't really care one way or another. But I remember reading about the the very thing that started the American Revolution, the actual fight, the actual war, was in Boston, the farmers and the, the people in the, the area that had farms and different businesses all had weapons and they had a militia. They had put together a militia because the British was, had been causing a lot of problems. And they were occupying Boston, they were trying to occupy New York, it was, it was really bad. And so what happened was the general in Boston from the British side decided that he was going to go out and confiscate weapons. So 
what happened? <laughs> he wasn't successful. They don't know who fired the first shot. Nobody's really sure. But that was what started the American Revolution, was that the British were going to try and take away the, the militia's weapons, their guns. So, interesting. So you've got the Second Amendment. The First Amendment was the freedom of speech. And that was extremely important because if you at that time, if you spoke anything against the king, King George, oh my God, you might get your head lopped off. It was, it was not good. So they were in danger anytime they would even have meetings. They were in danger. So we can move ahead now. War of 1812 was another war instigated by the British because the British were taking were confiscating ships that were going from the United States to Europe, and they were acting like pirates, essentially, and they were seizing ships and taking the sailors and making them serve in British ships, um, and that's what started the War of 1812. Then you have the Civil War. Once again, the British were involved. The British East India Company, the British Empire, never gave up on America. And when we broke away, that was, that was like a slap in the face. They had to retaliate. They, they could not give up one of their most important colonies. So the British were on the south side, of course, because they liked that system. They had, they had, um, they had made slavery illegal in England, but they were still trading in slaves. They were still pushing slaves on America. The South loved it because they were growing cotton and you had the landowners uh, and then you had the slaves. And it was a, uh, an abomination. It was the, uh, it was a feudal system at its worst. It was appalling, the conditions. And so the North, the abolition movement, that's where Abraham Lincoln came from, was the first president as a Republican, which was basically an abolition party, had to, could, did not want slaves anymore. They knew it was wrong. They knew it was bad. It was a horrible situation. And for them to have a declaration of independence saying all men are created equal, and then we have that situation, it just went against everything that, that we believed. Abraham Lincoln, his priority, because he had read a lot of George Washington's material, and he, his primary concern was to keep the United States together as one nation, because he knew that that was the only way that we were going to stay strong enough to defeat the British and to keep the British from coming in and taking us over again. So even the Russians, uh, Abraham Lincoln was friends with uh, the Russians and because we were selling them steam technology, rail technology, and they brought their ships over to New York Harbor and to San Francisco Harbor to protect the, the American shipping lines against the British, because the British were, were sabotaging the ships and trying to blockade us. Well, we defeated the South. It's a long story, and <clears throat> I'm going to be posting some other videos, educational videos, about Abraham Lincoln and about the fight that went on and about how the British actually were behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln because they didn't want Reconstruction. The British absolutely hated Abraham Lincoln. If you go to the Ford Theater, the little, little museum that they have there, you'll find that they found a code book on John Wilkes Booth when they caught him, where he had been in correspondence with the British in Canada. So he was a paid assassin. The so British had him assassinated. And that's the one thing that you can, you can know from history is that any time one of our presidents have ever been assassinated or, or a politician or 
a, a leader, a, a, uh, maybe somebody that's a civilian, but has been leading uh, in a religious capacity, like Martin Luther King, for instance, that when the oligarchy decides they have to assassinate someone, that is when you know that they are doing something good. Because when they get to a point where they are making a difference, which threatens the power of the oligarchy, look out. That's when you got to look and see what's going on. Now, the oligarchy has been shutting down freedom of speech. They have been censoring things. And they are censoring certain speech, not everything. You got to look at who they're censoring and who they're shutting down. And those are the people that are a danger to certain policies that they're trying to push. So I want to get back to the Jimmy Dore situation. I have been involved in, in studying in politics since 1980. I was in the Central Committee, Los Angeles Democratic Party Central Committee downtown back in the 90s. And I ran into the corruption then because I was against NAFTA. I was trying to talk about the dangers of NAFTA back then. There was a few friends of mine that um, were had gotten elected. And I remember that we were fought every direction. No matter what we wanted to do, the, the Democratic Party would fight us. They would tell me to shut up and sit down in the meetings. They were running an operation back then to silence anybody that would threaten any of these policies that the oligarchy wanted. Now, funny enough, it was pushed by Bill Clinton and guess who? Joe Biden. The policy of NAFTA has done more damage to this country and Mexico than anything else, probably. I mean, it has wrecked the economy. They are still, in Mexico, the wages are so bad that in the Miquiadoras, they are still paying the workers $6 a day. You can't live on, even in Mexico, you can't live on that. So, the point is, Jimmy Dore, compared to anyone else that I watch, and also... Uh, Craig and Fiorella on Convo Couch are two of the best shows that I have been able to find on YouTube, hands down. And what's strange about Jimmy is that he seems to be understanding exactly the war that we're in. He understands the fight. He understands that who is the enemy, that it's the oligarchy, and that the oligarchy owns Congress. And when people get pissed at him, when we attack the Democrats, particularly the progressives, so-called so progressives, the Pinos, that were the Justice Democrats that were voted in to do specific things, everybody gets all pissed off. Oh, you should be attacking Republicans. Well, here's the point. The Republicans were elected because of what they stand for. And we know what they stand for. They are for big business. They are for crushing the little guy. They are, for, they are against the minimum wage. They're against anything. They're pro-war. We know what they are. We know how they're going to vote. The difference is that the progressives that were elected were campaigning on $15 hour minimum wage, Medicare for all, ending the wars, free college, free community colleges, they, they were running on these policies, and then when they got in Congress, they folded. Bernie Sanders folded. Look at the, the march that we had. The, the Medicare for All march. Jimmy Dore showed up. Fiorella, Craig, there were several others that showed up. How many Justice Democrats showed up? AOC? No. Benny, Bernie Sanders? No. Where were these people? What in the hell is wrong with them? You would think that they would at least show up. That shows you who they really are. And that's why we attack them. Because this is what they should be doing. 
and that they were elected to do these things, and they're not. And then that's why we're going after them. There's no point in going after Republicans. You're not going to fix anything. And at this point, it's almost no point in going after the Justice Democrats. Because it looks like they don't give a shit about what they promised. They have been compromised. They have been corrupted by the Democratic Party, by the leadership of the Democratic Party, by Nancy Pelosi herself, one of the most corrupt criminals in Congress. Uh, I could go on and on. The point is that he sees the fight. He understands what the reality is of the situation. And hardly anyone else does. I was watching that dumbass that does the majority report, Sam Cedar. Uh, Jesus Christ, these people are idiots. And he had some comedian on making fun of Jimmy Dore. They didn't say anything. They were Because they are part of the Democratic Party, the establishment. They think that if they throw their eggs into the... Democratic Party establishment basket that sooner or later something good is going to happen. Well, we know that sooner or later nothing good is going to happen. Bernie Sanders collapse and, and back Biden, seeing we're going to push him left. Cenk Uger and Anna Kasparian on TYT, we're going to push him left. No one's pushed the guy left at all. Not at all. He campaigned specifically on $15 an hour minimum wage. What have we gotten? We know we're not going to get anything from the Republicans. But we should have been getting something from the Democrats because we are in a pandemic. Businesses have been forced to shut down. The, we, the, the economy is collapsing by no fault of our own. The government shut the businesses down. And they cause irreputable damage to at least 20% of the businesses are gone permanently. And we can't get some, some federal relief to make up for the losses? Look at Europe. They aren't going through this, this disaster. So I would like to talk to Jimmy. I met him the other day. And, but I didn't get a chance. We didn't have enough time to really talk. But what I would like to ask him is, you know, you say that you're a pothead in your garage and you're just some dumb comedian. But I beg to differ. There, you have studied something that you're not talking about. You understand history much better than you're admitting. Now, I know you have a, a bullshit meter where you can smell bullshit a mile away. That only goes so far. I would like to sit down with Jimmy and find out his background, what he learned, what he studied, the books that he's read. I know he said he's he read uh, Listen Liberal. And... So that's what I'm looking at. I've watched probably every show, you know, the Rational National, the Humanist Report. There's a few other good ones, like Chris Hedges is very good. Uh, there's, there's others. Kim Iverson is very good. Crystal Ball, uh, she's okay, but she still likes Ryan Grimm, so she's buying into some of the bullshit. Um, Kyle Kalinske... He still wants to work within the Democratic Party. He doesn't think that a third party is really going to work. You've got Glenn Greenwald, one of the best journalists that we've got. You've got Julian Assange. Why is he in jail? Why are they putting the messenger in jail when you've got war criminals running free with book deals and speeches and getting tongue baths from people like... TYT and other shit lib organizations and other shit lib uh, media outlets. You've got fucking morons that wanted to apologize to George Bush for being such a great com uh, president compared to Donald Trump. You've got Max Blumenthal and you've got Aaron Mate and the guy that he works with. There's some really good reporters out there. There's some really good people. And that's who you need to focus on. The LaRouche organization has a LaRouche PAC website. They are doing some really good work. I can make a list of a lot of people who are actually doing some good work. 
You've got Sean Atwood trying to uncover the things about Epstein. You've got some really good people out there to try and get the truth out. That's another question I wanted to ask. Why is nothing happening about the Epstein case? Very little. Why? You know why? Because the people that were involved, his co-conspirators, were part of the oligarchy, part of the 1%, part of the billionaire class, part of the pedophile, satanic assholes. They don't care about human life. They only care about money and power. They're, they're psychopaths, they're sociopaths. They will lie, cheat, kill to get what they want. And they don't give a shit. Like 9-11, for instance. Planes went into the building. It's probably about 3,000 people that were killed. Oh, you can't talk about an inside job conspiracy. They would never do that. Well, I'm telling you, they would do that. In fact, we're lucky that only 3,000 were killed. They would do that because look what they got. They got the Patriot Act. They got to go in to the Middle East and take out Iraq, take out Libya. They were able to take out Somalia. They were able to go in to different nations in Africa. They were able to go into Afghanistan, loot, pillage. You might as well call them the Vandals, the Roman Empire. That's why you were there. It's not for human rights or any kind of moral rights. And then when you, you're convincing the American population to go to war for patriotism, that's the ultimate lie. It's just a fact. And it's a real sad state in this country that Americans don't understand that. And every time there's a new war, they get hoodwinked into believing that we're fighting, we're fighting for our freedom. Really. Analyze the situation and see who we are fighting for. See who wins from these wars. See who makes the money. See who gets to push around their weight. Who gets hegemony over these areas. Who gets to loot them. The major corporations. Same thing in World War II. When the Nazis had set up concentration camps, they had slave labor camps all over Europe. Major American corporations were having products made by slaves run by the Nazis in Europe. Ford, Coca-Cola. I mean, I could name off company after company after company that were involved. They didn't give a shit about human life. They, they see human beings as pawns to be discarded at will. So, next time somebody tries to convince you that you got to go to war to protect our freedom, Tell them to go shove it. Why don't you go? You go carry a gun. You go on the front line and look your enemy in the eye and realize that he's got a family too. He's got wife and kids. He's got a home. He wants to send his kids to school. But he's been convinced of the same bullshit that we're convinced of. That's the reality of it. I think, and Jimmy Dore thinks, and Fiorella and Craig on Combo Couch think that a third party is probably the only thing that's going to work. Now, we do have Nina Turner running for Congress, and she is a fighter. She is a fighter. Now, that is the last hope we have for the Democratic Party, for her to get in there and kick some political ass and light a fire under AOC and Ro Khanna and Ilhan Omar, and all of these so-called justice Democrats light a fire under their goddamn asses to do what they promised during the campaigns, what they promised they were going to do. Do what you said. Do what your donors thought you were going to stand for, because you had people donating to your campaigns that were grassroots organizers, were the people that were donating $10. They believed in you, and you failed us. So if Nina Turner can't turn you around, 
then I don't know what is. But I'm going with the peoplesparty.org. I have already registered in Los Angeles uh, on the, uh, the ballot. It's re uh, they are a official registered party in California. We need to volunteer, we need to join the party, and we need to donate money, and we need to get out there and get our, the, the People's Party registered as official parties. Because one thing you got to remember, and this was the mistake that I made originally, I thought, I was thinking more of on the presidential side, because a presidential candidate on a third party is, is not going to have a chance in hell because of the way that the Democrats and Republicans have set the system up. They have made it so that the third party will fail. But in state races, congressional races, senatorial races, local races, the People's Party, we can get people in on those races. We can get people in to Congress. If we can get a handful of people like what the Justice Democrats were supposed to do, then we can make a difference. We can build a coalition. We can tell the Democrats and Republicans to go stuff it. Because you've got to have a majority to pass anything. And if we've got five or ten good, strong Progressive candidates with a spine and a character and ethics and morals that will get in there and fight for what's right instead of their own stupid careers or trying to suck up to Nancy Pelosi for a couple of crumbs and some favors. Then we can change this country and we can fix the things that are terribly wrong. And one of the big things we can do is end these wars and get the finances of this country in line because the Federal Reserve is what's causing the financial chaos in this country because they set up the system where the federal government, the Treasury, has to borrow money from central banks. That is one of the fights that Abraham Lincoln had. That's one of the fights that Washington had with Alexander Hamilton was the fight between having a national bank where the, where the American government could issue credit to push certain policies like building canals and roads and infrastructure, steam and rail during the 1800s. The problem is when you borrow money from central banks and you have to pay it back with interest, it makes it very difficult to do these, these projects. Well, I guess you could call it printing money, but it's, it's called an uptick. When you're sitting in front of a computer and you've got someone's bank account online, you can type in a million dollars into that account and they have a million dollars. You don't have to print the money. You don't have to do anything. Now, that can cause inflation if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you're building stadiums and hotels and very expensive luxury homes that most people can't afford. But if you're spending that money on infrastructure and jobs programs, like, for instance, NAWAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, which is to bring water down from Alaska through Canada into the western United States, which will solve our water problems for 100 years. We have a situation here in California where we're going to run out of water. And a lot of farming goes on here. And they're talking about, well, we're going to have to cut back. You can't cut back water on farming. We need high-speed rail. How many of you go to Europe? You don't even need a car. You can hop on a, a high-speed rail or, or a, a subway system. It's, we don't have any of that. We have little you know, trolley cars and click-clack, click-clack trains that, that you could almost walk faster. We need high-speed rail. We need maglev. Guess who has the fastest train in the world? China has the fastest train in the world. It's a maglev train. And it goes 431 kilometers an hour. They've got trains now that are going to go faster than that. That's going, you don't need all the airplanes that we're flying. Because those use tons of fuel and create all the carbon dioxide. If, you want to, if you're worried about carbon dioxide then what you need to be pushing is nuclear power and electric cars 
and electric trains. And you want to do something about carbon dioxide, that's how you do it. Because if you're going to build electric cars and you're going to run them on coal-powered plants, then you're going to create more pollution than if you just ran an automobile on gasoline. Look it up. It's a fact. You cannot run an economy on solar. You cannot run an economy on wind because it's, uh, it's intermittent. You got days where there's no wind. You got days where there's no sun. It doesn't work at night. So if you want to destroy the world and kill millions, then you can push that green deal the way it is with the coal and the, the solar panels and the windmills, which are a joke. You can, you can run your TVs on solar power if you want or heat your water, but you can't run an industrial society on that technology. It's way too expensive and it's not efficient yet. We need nuclear power, specifically the thorium reaction, the thorium cycle, because Around World War II, when the scientists were trying to decide, should we go with thorium or uranium, they picked uranium because you can build bombs with uranium and you can't with thorium. So that's why they, they decided to go with uranium. But we can still develop thorium. We can still start working on fusion technology. That's ultimately what we want, is the power of the sun. Because that is the ultimate energy source for a thousand years. So, that's the point I wanted to make. I know I've gone on longer than I should have. But you need to watch Jimmy Dore. He's got a great show because he also can put up the statements that people make, the tweets that people make, the, the videos of the stupid Congress, the stupid shit they say. And you can see it with your own eyes. You can hear it with your own ears. What the hell are these people doing? I'm trying to work on my channel so that I could do that. It's, uh, the problem is I have a job and I, don't, I can only do this part time. So that's the situation. So watch Convo Couch. Watch Kim Iverson. Watch Chris Hedges. Matt Taibbi and Katie Halper. They're very good. Uh, don't watch TYT. All you're going to see is, is MSNBC part two. Um, that's what you need to look at. I'll make a list of some more good people. Watch RT, Russian television, because they have a Washington bureau. And some of the people that got kicked out of Fox and CNN and MSNBC went over to RT. You got Jesse Ventura over there. You've got Rick Sanchez. You've got some, you know, Chris Hedges has his own show. There's some good shows. And the thing that they say on RT is that they don't censor us. Isn't that ironic? But if you're on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, there's certain things you can't talk about. You are not allowed to talk about. That's why Ed Schultz got kicked off, because he wanted to talk about Bernie Sanders. And MSNBC said, nope, you're not going to cover Bernie Sanders. Interesting. You can go and talk about Bernie Sanders all you want in RT. So, who's the fascist? Who's violating the First Amendment? Who is incarcerating more people in the world than any other nation? American Empire. Who is wreaking havoc around the world? The American Empire. Who is crushing populations and destroying the Middle East for oil and natural resources? The American Empire, the oligarchy. So that's the facts. Look it up. Read some books. It's a great idea. Have a nice day. This is Terry Allen, and I bid you peace.